Hello and welcome to Simply Tax. This past weekend, I was doing something that I'll say still doesn't come naturally to me, despite the hours upon hours that I've spent doing it, and that's listening to myself speak. This time, though, was a bit different than working on the episodes of this podcast as usual, as I was tuning in to a recent conversation I had with previous Simply Tax guest Heath Alloway on the third episode of his new podcast, The Upstream Leader Podcast. Heath and I had a discussion on leadership and a wide range of topics to include creating Simply Tax, where I personally hope to be as a leader in 10 years, and even the reason I recommend watching Disney and Pixar's Soul, even if you don't have children. Now, towards the end of our discussion, Heath asked me if there was one person I would be really excited about having on the podcast, and I didn't have a name to give him at the moment. I mean, he pretty much stumped me on the spot, as there are so many great guests that we've had on and that we plan to have on in upcoming episodes that I couldn't just name one, and honestly, I don't know that I even could narrow it down now, even after giving it some more thought. Now, that being said, our guest today is someone who most definitely tops this list in my book, as he's a personal role model of mine. I'm excited to share with you on the podcast today a conversation I had with Ted Dickman in his final days as CEO at BKD ahead of his retirement on May 31, 2021. As you might know, our goal on this podcast is to boil down complex topics for business professionals that include both tax and those related to tax, business, or the accounting profession. I thoroughly enjoyed checking all of these boxes in a conversation on leadership that I think you'll agree with me that anyone can learn from, whether you're fresh out of college, looking forward to your next chapter in your journey after a successful 38-year career, or somewhere in the middle. So with that, here's my interview with someone I am honored and excited to welcome to Simply Tax. Well, thanks, Damian. Uh, my name's Ted Dickman, and I've had the privilege of being a part of this firm really my entire career. If you count the uh, predecessor firm that uh, joined with, with BKD in 2001 and was even more fortunate to end my career here over the last nine years to serve as the firm's chief executive officer. And so I'm retiring after 38 years in the profession, many of them as a tax professional, ready and excited for that next chapter in life. And I'm looking forward to talking through some of that with you. Uh, maybe get some insights from you. I know you've been a role model to me, and so it's it's quite an honor to be able to talk to you here again, I guess I should say, on the podcast. And technically, you were on our first season when we were when we were an internal uh, podcast at that point in time. So yeah, thanks for, for coming back on and sharing some of your insights. And, and maybe what we'll start with is how you describe that role as CEO and really what that entails. When, when you have so many talented people in an organization, what I've come to realize, it's it's a little bit uh, akin to being like uh, the conductor of an orchestra, right? The orchestra conductor has all these incredibly talented musicians, and and really your job is to help bring them together, get everyone playing to the, their very best, and and kind of harmonizing in terms of how we work together at, as an organization, as a firm, and again, just very fortunate to have so many people in their firm like that. People like yourself, Damien, who runs this incredible podcast that it's been fun to watch grow. And and uh, I'd, I'd say probably the other really important role that I've learned and, and have a whole different appreciation for as the CEO of the firm is, is you're really, you're the champion of the firm's culture. And I've learned to be very, very cognizant of our culture and how do we intentionally you know, really develop and affirm that culture so that everybody feels the culture and, and how decisions get made, how the firm operates. That That's really the definition of culture and understanding that and trying to, again, optimize the continued development of the firm's culture has been, been a really big part of the role I've learned to embrace. Well, I will say from my experience and I guess similar in the regard that, you know, I I came into BKD obviously through a predecessor firm uh, as well, and that was something that instantly struck with me uh, and stuck with me was the fact that you know the culture was just so great at BKD, and I, I guess I have my thoughts on that. But why do you think BKD has such a great culture? Well, you know, we were all blessed to join a firm that already had a really strong culture, and and what's really beautiful about it is that it continues to evolve. I mean, culture is not a stagnant thing. And, you know, the culture this firm had 30 years ago and 20 years ago and even 10 years ago is has evolved, but it's still built on that platform. And, and, and the underlying 
element of our culture that I think is more visible today than maybe ever before is just the whole root notion of service to others, you know, understanding that we're not only here to serve our clients, but we're here to serve, support one another and help help each other be the very best professionals we can be and work together as a team. And that part of our culture, I think we just understand so much better today and, and understand how to nurture that and continue to, to grow and build upon it. That learning and, and, and going up across comes from experience. Well, it's interesting, you're making the, the comment about the conductor in an orchestra, the similarities there, and I know some of that comes from experience as well. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna read you back a quote here, uh, one that you gave to the Indianapolis Business Journal a few years back. And the quote you said, "For me, it's just been terrific as an experience, but I feel like all my experiences along the way have helped me be better prepared for it." So I guess let me throw you two questions here on that. First, would you still describe serving as CEO of one of the largest accounting firms in the country as being a terrific experience? And second, what were the experiences that prepared you for it? Great, great questions. The experience has absolutely been phenomenal. There's a lot of dimensions to it, but the common denominator to all of them are, are just the relationships, whether they're relationships that I've been fortunate to be a part of internally in the firm, which is the predominant parts of my day, and then to some degree, the external relationships that I've been able to, to develop with others across our profession and our industry. But there's just such a spirit within our firm and even within our industry of wanting to help one another, supporting one another, sharing ideas and best practices that I've really, really grown to appreciate and, and hopefully was able to positively contribute to, in that regard. The part of your question about what experiences did I have that helped me prepare for it, like all young professionals, made a lot of mistakes growing up. And so the key is just learning from them, right, and trying to reflect back. And And I think all those experiences working with people and, and the one that became most apparent to me in terms of developing as a leader was truly being willing to understand other people's points of view, kind of the old seven habits of highly effective, to understand someone else's perspective. And until you can do that, it's hard to have any influence as a leader with others. Learning how to do that, learning to be patient, learning to truly value the input of others was, was a big step forward to me once I began to truly understand and, and, and live by that. Uh, you know, you can't really fake that. You got hey. to gotta really believe it um, to, to make it effective. And I certainly needed a lot of other people that I had to rely on uh, and understand their perspectives to help, help this firm be better. How did you go about maybe developing that skill or is it just one that you're sort of just born with that you just kind of naturally have? Well, you know, I, one, I was certainly surrounded by a lot of good role models throughout my career and even in my formative years with my family and my parents. But, but I started reading uh, on some different books on leadership, and, and in particular, probably my all-time favorite book, business book, for sure, is, is Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And, and when I began to read that and, and kind of understand intellectually what he was trying to get you to understand and then started thinking about other people that I'd been around throughout the course of my life, it, it all began to click, you know, in terms of what defined, you know, the differences in, in leaders. And it's like anything else. You just try to begin to practice and mimic the, those same habits and try to hold yourself accountable, try to get permission to other people to hold you accountable to be better at whatever you're asking them to do. So I'm curious, when would you say that you read that book initially and, and have you read it more than once, perhaps? I first read that book probably over 20 years ago. In fact, I was fortunate. I actually got to hear Stephen Covey speak two different times in person. I kind of sought out. He Back then, he was young enough. He was traveling and teaching the Seven Habits. Read his book a couple times. I've my original book. I've got highlights. I've got sticky notes all over it. Was kind of so enthralled with it. I even took our family through kind of a 
family mission, you know, statement, you know, what we wanted to be as a family and what we wanted to stand for. I got a few eye rolls on that at the time, I think, <laughs> but, uh, but that's all right. I think they appreciated it now. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, he was very influential in helping me kind of crystallize my thinking around, uh, you know, some of those really important habits. And I guess I asked that too, from my own personal experience, I guess, of getting exposed to that, some of that earlier on that I, I maybe just didn't have as much of the, the experience, I guess, or the foundation of experience to appreciate it. Maybe like uh, with, with the family, right? When, when you're younger, maybe you don't appreciate, sometimes you get a little older, you, you, you kind of do. And not to say I didn't take anything away from it the first time I read it. I, I certainly did, but it definitely seemed like there were things I understood better, I guess, revisiting it. Right. Absolutely. So maybe along those lines, and I guess maybe perhaps this is part of it, but are there skills that you've had to evolve or you think that you've evolved uh, maybe even personally as a result of your role as CEO? A absolutely. Um, and I'm, I'm still evolving, but uh, I'll evolve into the next chapter here. But, um, you know, I, I think like many of us, you know, you got to learn to trust other people if early on you kind of think you can do it all and you're kind of invincible and you can you know conquer anything and what i began to learn was what was really important was focusing on the entire team building our team up make, making sure everybody around myself and the team i was a part of was, was, was as successful as they could be and you know kind of kind of turned the focus from me to, to others and and that transition to learning to pay attention to what others needed and how you could support others was a big defining moment in terms of kind of going to the next level of, of being able to have influence as a leader. I guess a testament to that perhaps, and I've got some stats here. So when you, when you came in, you started your tenure as CEO, the firm was uh, 30 offices in 12 states with revenues of $391 million. Uh, and that was 2011 numbers there. Now the firm's uh, 40 offices, 18 states, and looks like on track for 750 million for this fiscal year that's ended here. What would you say were the primary drivers, you know, again, maybe working through others to achieve that growth? Well, you just answered it, David. I, I, mean, I mean, the short answer is, you know, the drivers of that growth were our people. Um, and I say that not flippantly at all. I mean, you know, our growth, when you break it down, is a combination of a couple areas where growth comes from. One is organic growth, just, you know, naturally attracting new clients and growing the business year over year, kind of organically. And that takes people. I mean, that takes our people doing an outstanding job in terms of serving clients, building that reputation, becoming famous, being willing to talk to other prospective clients about, you know, becoming a BKD client. Uh, the the other part of growth then is is that common you know where firms you know join BKD via you know kind of those mergers M and A kinds of transactions and or people that are just direct admit you know talents people that individually that we've been able to hire and in those cases it's, again it's really gets down to people it takes people in those situations that are willing to take that leap of faith to to join the BKD team and be a part of it and embrace our culture and how we do things. And it takes a lot of BKDers internally who are willing to step in and help support through that transition, help coach, nurture, and encourage people through that transition process. And all that growth at the end of the day is, is all built on the backs of people that have done a lot of hard work first and foremost. So. I'm curious, though, too, you know, obviously making the transition and, and becoming CEO, I, I would imagine there's probably some things that, that you encountered or that you, the experiences that you had that you maybe didn't expect going into it. What are some of those? The biggest surprise, as I reflect back, that I didn't appreciate for sure was kind of the, the vast kind of breadth of, of the role and kind of the expectations that come with it. There's it's just a lot of people uh, internally and to some degree externally that want your time and want your involvement, want your support and commitment. And, you know, at some level, it's there. there's not enough time. And, and so learning 
where your unique talents and gifts are and what where your role might most uniquely be necessary because a lot of things could be done by other leaders as well and, and figuring that out uh, so that you could kind of use you know your time in the most effective way possible for the benefit of the firm and knowing again there's so many other leaders that can step in and handle so many areas and needs within the firm. In a world of infinite resources, we could get it all done and do all the things, but that's just not the world that we live in. And, and in my experience, I don't know that there's really any silver bullet that's been thrown out there, but any piece of advice for me or, or others on kind of doing that and figuring that out and figuring out really where you can add the most value? Well, I think just stopping from time to time and just reflecting on where are your gifts, what, where is your passion, because usually where your passion is is where your gifts are also, because a lot of times we can all kind of get caught up in the day-to-day -day or the kind of the urgent but not necessarily important kinds of activities, and you're just kind of firefighting all the time. And that's all things that need to be done, but unless you intentionally stop and kind of self-reflect and think about, you know, what, what are you really good at, what do you really enjoy doing, and then being more intentional about making that happen, which re requires finding other w places for the activities to go. And that usually means you gotta develop some other people and get them set up to take those things on and help them be successful uh, with those, those activities from which they'll learn and grow and develop and start that whole cycle over for themselves. Until you get to that point, it's a challenge to, to grow unless, unless you're willing to step back and reflect and then make some intentional changes. So maybe we'll rewind here. I know you said, you know, 38 years in the profession, which is, um, yes, congratulations. And that's impressive and, and, and great. If you're going to go back now, 38 years, or, or maybe now to somebody that's just starting out, what advice would you, would you have, or would you have given to yourself uh, 38 years ago? Well, I, I've been reflecting on those things a lot more lately as I approach the retirement date. You know, I, I'm, I'm a sports fan, and John Wooden's a legendary college basketball coach at UCLA, and he, he had a saying that, uh, kind of a mantra that he always used with his players, and it was, you know, be quick, but don't hurry. I've always thought about that a lot. For a while, it perplexed me exactly what he meant, and I was always trying to kind of figure it out and how that applied to, to life. You know, so using a little bit of hit that framework, you know, probably advice I would have would probably be three thoughts here. One would be be patient and yet strive for excellence in everything that you're doing. Be balanced, but be laser-focused, and be thoughtful yet act boldly. And kind of like his mantra, they're a little counterintuitive at first. You got to kind of think about them a little bit. But I think the key is, is kind of learning and understanding that balance between, between those concepts and being patient, in particular in your younger years, uh, while you're learning and you know, developing you know, to become around the whole concept of excellence of what you're doing and learning your craft is, is certainly one of the key early elements of working your way through the profession. But but all those other things begin to, you know, even, you know, being thoughtful, but acting boldly, that, that's something you can, again, do early in your career. Uh, you know, again, appreciating the dynamics of both of those. There's moments where you have to be thoughtful, but there's other moments where you got to act boldly, uh, put yourself out. You know, you've taken your share of risk here, starting up a podcast, right? I mean, there's risk of failure, and uh, but you're willing to take that risk and be bold and paid a lot of dividends, so. Those are really good. I'm kind of like sitting here, you you probably can see the the, the gears are kind of turning a little bit here <laughs> on, on those. Those are, those are, it's really powerful. Like you said, getting a little counterintuitive that thoughtfully bold or thoughtfulness and bold, but you know, you really need, you, you, you put it in the thought so that when, you, when the time comes, you you can be bold and you can do it with confidence and you can do it do it well and execute well. Wow, no, those are those are really good, and I think they can they would serve they would serve well. I, I, again, I'm glad we're doing a podcast here, so I can go back later and and uh, and kind of digest and think on them a little bit more too. I wanted to jump in here real quick to share that I did just that and spent some time reflecting this past weekend on the three thoughts Ted offered here. 
along with that great quote from John Wooden. It really was a great exercise, and I highly recommend you do the same. For me, this involved grabbing a notebook and creating a mind map around words like balanced and thoughtful to help me unpack what they mean for me, and then using this to create aspirational targets and actionable items. I don't know if we've mentioned it here, but you, you started off on the tax side and, and you're a tax guy. So maybe if you're going to take that advice for those that are starting out or for a career in tax and focus on tax, what would you say there? You know, I, I again, reflecting back, I think what attracted me to tax, and I don't know that I could have articulated it early on, but I, I understand it today, is understanding the impact that you're having with your clients, the impact you're having on their financial situation. And what, what I quickly learned as I began to work with clients was, you know, kind of the old adage, the more they know you care, the more they, they value what you have to offer. I think the sooner you realize as a professional, what you're doing is really can make a positive impact on others, generates a lot of satisfaction. You know, you kind of figure out your why, you know, why am I doing this and what impact am I having? And, you know, we have a lot of great clients and being able to have a positive contribution into their businesses or their families, financial situations is extremely rewarding, uh, at least it was for me. I couldn't agree with you more. And that's a big driver. And I think why I love what I do. And it's it's maybe getting beyond the numbers and, uh, you know, the forms and all that, which is, uh, you know, obviously certainly very important and enjoy those elements of it. But yeah, getting to the people behind those numbers and the and the tax returns and, and all of that, and really understanding the, the help that it's uh, able to provide or the problems it's able to solve, that really makes you feel good at the end of the day. Yeah, it really does. You'd mentioned it kind of in earlier in passing that you've obviously had such a, a great impact on on our firm, but as well as also the, the accounting profession. And that's something that I, I guess is a goal of mine is to do both, to make a positive impact on, on both the firm and, and profession. So any advice you'd have, I guess, for me on doing the same? You know, Damien, I, I, advice to you, and I'd probably give it to any, you know, young, rising partner, high, high caliber performer, just as you are. And, you know, and that's, um, you know, it's just to never lose that desire to get better every day. That's the difference between what I've seen over the years of people that are just truly the outstanding professionals and serving clients and others versus those that uh, maybe at some point they begin to flatten out. They quit really striving to be better. They become complacent with with their skills and what they're doing. And I think if you want to be a great one, you know, you're just, you're driven every day to, to be better at your craft. And, you know, it's true about athletes and musicians and artists and, you know, you name it, any, any professional. The, the great ones are every day, they're honing, their expertise and, you know, trying to get better at what they do every day. That's good advice uh, for sure. And, and definitely like words that come into being the most powerful, perhaps when you're feeling like you're needing to take a break or something say, oh, you got to keep that drive, keep the, the forward momentum going, which I'm sure part of that too, is, is making sure that you're taking care of self and whatnot too, like you kind of alluded to, right? So yeah. that you're able to kind of continue to do that. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, uh, embedded in all that is yeah, that you've got balance, right? So yeah. it's that, you know, getting better every day is, you know, on, on in the time that you've chosen to, you know, be your professional time, then, then that's where you want to, you know, always be striving to be better. But absolutely, you know, taking care of yourself physically, mentally, spiritually, your family, you know, all those things are absolutely need to, you know, be balanced to be the very best, best version of yourself you can be. Well, I guess maybe as we kind of wrap up the interview here, I, I do have to ask you one at least more tax-related question here, being that it's simply tax and all. And again, a question that I asked you when we were on the internal first season here of the podcast was what your favorite internal revenue code section is. I just want to see if it's the same and, and perhaps if it's changed at all. Well, I haven't practiced much tax since that first uh, podcast when you asked me that question. So I, I believe what I shared with you back then was Section 1031, the, the like-kind exchange uh -huh. sections of the code. I, what I've come to understand from some colleagues is that uh, 
those provisions have been pretty well neutered these days in terms of the, their availability for, for tax planning. But, but if, you know, reflecting back on what sections I, I in particular enjoyed, it, it was that. And if you said, well, why? It, it, was, it probably gets back to have that, making that impact with your clients. I always felt like when I was, you know, helping a client with a 1031 transaction, one, it was not an area that many people understood that well. And, you know, typically with these were real estate transactions that I was working with. And so they were significant, there were significant savings. And it was a combination of not just tax issues, but also really helping them think through the business aspect of the transaction and making sure both the business and the tax piece of it worked well for them. But it was fun. It was very creative. And again, you always felt like it, it made a big impact for, for our clients. So no, and I'll, I'll agree with you that that I think 1031 has that element of it where there's this uh, is really tied to the, the transaction and it's integral to how it's structured and so forth. So, yeah, it, you get a little uh, a little extra fun there, I guess, if it's OK to you know use the word fun when talking about the Internal Revenue Code. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, maybe before we wrap up, just a few kind of other questions we'll ask here, kind of a wrap-up segment we'll do. Maybe we'll start with a favorite trip that you've taken. Wow. Done a lot of fun trips. Been fortunate in that regard. I, our highlight trip might be... Ted had a really great answer here. And you can find out where and why it was a favorite, along with things like his favorite restaurant in Chicago and what he had planned for his first day of retirement with our Behind the Numbers segment that we'll post to our YouTube channel soon. For now... Search for our channel on YouTube and hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out. All right, to close out our episode today, I thought we'd wrap up with some great advice and final thoughts from Ted. Well, um, we've covered a lot of ground and you know, probably my final piece of advice, I've tried to remind people uh, here over the last several years of my career, because I have to try to remind myself of that, and that is is to enjoy the journey. I, I found myself early in my career where I always felt like I was chasing that next goal, that next aspiration. And, you know, as soon as you hit it, you know, you're I was kind of like on to the next one. And and you know, it was almost like this game, keep climbing the mountain higher and higher. And as I got a little older, I began to realize, you know, the the joy in in all of those things wasn't when I actually got to the destination, it was the journey that I really enjoyed. And so, you know, just recognizing that along the way and enjoying the journey along the way will give you, you know, a lot more moments of, of joy in your life, I think. That's a great reminder and one I need to remind myself of as well, oftentimes. So thanks for that. And again, thanks for your, for your time. I know you're a, you're a busy guy, Ted. And, and so I, I do greatly appreciate you carving off some time here to share your experiences. So thank you. Damien, it's been my pleasure. Enjoy your podcast and look forward to continuing to listen to them in the future. I thought Ted packed a lot of wisdom into our conversation and appreciate the opportunity to share it with you today. You can learn more about Ted and get links to the resources that we mentioned in our interview at bkd.com slash text. Let me know what you thought of the episode today. And if you're comfortable, share some of your takeaways from reflecting on those three pieces of advice that Ted offered. You can find me out on Twitter where I tweet about tax at Damian Martin CPA, on Instagram at TaxDad, on YouTube by subscribing to our Simply Tax YouTube channel, and out on LinkedIn. I'm Damian Martin, and thank you for listening. The information contained in this episode of Simply Tax is based on data available as of the date of its release. BKD is under no obligation to update this information if changes occur. Applying this information to your specific situation requires careful consideration of all facts and circumstances. Information provided is not to be considered as tax, legal, or financial advice. Please consult your tax advisor before acting on any matters covered. 